Perfect. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Anaheim, California, the Honda Center for the NCAA Division I West Regional Men's Basketball Tournament. Go over a few notes before we get started. We're st slated to get started at the top of the hour, uh, first with Texas A&M coach Billy Kennedy. Then we'll have student athletes Jalen Jones, Alex Caruso, and Daniel House. Uh, they will be at 115. At 130, we'll have Oklahoma student athletes Ryan Spangler, Isaiah Cousins, and Buddy Heald, followed by Oklahoma coach Long Kruger at 145. Uh, Julie St. Cyr here in the front row is your interview room coordinator. Uh, so if you have any questions or any problems, you can uh, ask her and she can hopefully help you out. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody right now to please take a moment, turn off your cell phones, or in the very least, turn off the ringers. I uh, want to make sure that we don't have any interruptions. So how we're going to do this, most of you have been here before, but we'll just go over it anyway. Uh, I'm going to have you raise your hand. I will call on you in as best the order I see you. Uh, I'm going to give preference to people who've asked or who haven't asked questions yet as we get later on, but I will try to get to everybody as best we can. Uh, we have two microphone holders. We have Shane and Sean. Shane and Sean will make their way around. They'll give you the microphone. I'm going to ask that when you get the microphone, you please identify yourself and your affiliation, please. Um, when you have a question for one of the student athletes, please direct it at a specific student athlete. If you have, you know, I, I know there's often the wide ranging, hey, I, this is for anybody on the dais. If you want me to pick who's going to answer the question, I will, but otherwise, please let us know who you'd like to have answer the question. Uh, a reminder that per the NCAA, no cell phones or tablets are permitted to film or record in the interview area. Uh, satellite coordinates. Satellite coordinates for today from 1545 through 1800. SE, satellite SES3K02B, booked by CBS, the NCAA. The downlink is 11753.5. Again, 11753.5. Our pool reporter is Ed Graney. I hope I got that right. Ed Graney of the Long, Long, Las Vegas Review Journal. Full transcripts of the press conferences will be available in the media room shortly uh, after the press conferences, courtesy of Deb Bowman and ASAP right over here. Uh, once again, we're going to start off with a statement from the coach, Kennedy, when he gets here, and then we'll open up for questions. When it's the student athletes, we'll just go straight into questions from y'all. Any questions? We're all excited? Okay, here we go. All right, we're joined by Texas A&M head coach Billy Kennedy. We're going to open up with a statement from Coach Kennedy, and then we'll open it up to questions. Coach, welcome to Anaheim. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, obviously, we're excited to, to be here and thankful to uh, be able to get here and uh, having beaten Northern Iowa in an uh, unbelievable game, and uh, they were a really good team, and now we're playing another really good team in Oklahoma. So... Um, Right now, it's all Oklahoma and trying to figure out a way to slow them down. Okay, we're going to go right here in the blue shirt in the fourth row, and then we're going to go all the way in the back. Gabe Bach, Tex Ags. Billy, how good of a job has your team done of now moving past that epic win and putting all their focus on OU? Uh, you know, I, I, think we're, I think we're ready for Oklahoma. You know, I think uh, Monday, obviously, was a good day to, to get back and – uh, kind of recuperate and refuel, so to speak. And um, yesterday we had a really good practice. Our guys are very familiar with Oklahoma. We see them on television all the time. They're a former Big 12 opponent. So uh, we played them a couple of years ago. So they know it's at stake, and uh, I think we're ready to go. We're going to go to the gentleman all the way in the back. Uh, Billy Meyermack at ESPN. What does that do to your team's confidence when you make that kind of an effort? in that situation? How much does that impact your team's confidence? Well, we, we were confident before. I think it can only help. Uh, but I, I, I think we got to learn from what we did wrong and put ourselves in that situation. Uh, and our guys know it was incredible, and they're thankful. But um, I think hopefully it only helps it. And, and not, we shouldn't become arrogant, that's for sure. We know how fortunate we were to win. We're going to go right here in the third row in the white shirt, please. 
Hi, Billy. Josh, Peter with USA Today. Mm -hmm. um, a lot has been written about your successful management of Parkinson's, mm -hmm. and I read that stress can lead to a worsening of symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, with that in mind, how do you handle a situation like this when you're at a, a big event and there is a lot of stress? You know, it, it hasn't had a negative effect on me. Um, I'm pretty laid back. I'm from New Orleans, the Big Easy, so um, I've coached a lot of games, but I, I've been blessed that the stress hasn't really been a factor. Uh, and it, this disease affects people in different ways, and uh, hopefully uh, that won't be a, 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 a symptom as, as we go further down the years from my, in my career. We have the third row on the right there. Hey, Coach. Kate Haropoulos, Dallas Morning News. Along, somewhat along those lines, the fact that five years after the Parkinson's diagnosis, you're coaching in your first Sweet 16 as a head coach. Is there a message in that? You know, it's no different message than uh, Michael J. Fox or Janet Reno or so many other people who have had the disease and, and stressful situ jobs and have gone on and been successful. Uh, I've been totally blessed that uh, the symptoms aren't greater than they are, and I've got great doctors, and uh, I, I see them once a year. I've been fortunate I only have to go once a year, and, and I'm thankful that I'm in a position where I get the best care and best support, and, and my wife is awesome, you know, so she's a nutrition junkie, unfortunately, but uh, it, it's helped me in, in, in fighting this disease, and I, we think it's a big part of why my symptoms are so mild. We're gonna go back in the back, please. Billy Chip Howard, Sports Radio, 1150. What's the biggest challenge you face with this Oklahoma team? Um, oh, we play in Oklahoma now, huh? Uh, no, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, uh, Buddy Heald and, and their guards, their guards are really good, and um, you know, you got to get back defensively and, and protect the three-point line. Uh, we're a defensive-oriented team, and, uh, you know, that's something we spend a lot of time on, but we haven't played a team that's as lethal offensively on the perimeter as they, as they are. We're going to do right here in the second row and then back in the fifth row. Brian Aber from the Oklahoma. Billy, you talked about Oklahoma's guards, but I'm, I'm curious about uh, your impressions of Ryan Spangler on the inside for them. Sp Spangler is, you know, uh, an engine that protects the paint and keeps him going. So he, he hurt us on the glass when we played him a few years ago. He's got a great motor, great energy guy, and he's a blue-collar guy. I mean, he understands that for them to be successful, him and Kadeem have to do a lot of the dirty work uh, that the guards don't necessarily do, although they, they've done a lot also. But uh, I think Sp Sp Spangler's a, a, a hidden key for their team when he's playing with great energy and making threes, they're really hard to beat. We're going to go back here on the left, and then we'll have three on the right. Aaron Torres, Fox Sports. Just a quick question. I know you're looking ahead now to Oklahoma, but did you allow yourself at all the chance to look back? I mean, we're talking about a historic comeback the other day. Uh, have you had a chance to just take it in and appreciate it maybe as a fan? Yeah, you know, I watched it on, on the plane, and then I got home. Um, probably we got home 1.30 or 2 in the morning, uh, Sunday night or Monday early in the morning. And my wife and I... Um, we watched Sports Center. We watched everything, and tried to enjoy it. You know, for about two hours. Unfortunately, we were up to about 3:30 or 4. Uh, they replayed the game actually on CBS when we got home. So, uh, a lot of our guys even watched it, and uh, so we were able to get that behind us and, and, and enjoy watching it and recognize how blessed we really were to win. We're gonna go on the right side in the tie in the fifth row, please. Brian Brinkley, KFOR TV, Oklahoma City. Coach, the few times that Buddy Heald has been, I don't want to say shut down, but had not the quite, kind of the games we you're used to seeing from him, have you been able to learn anything from some of those games, such as West Virginia, the Big 12 tournament? Um, we watched that game, obviously. I thought West Virginia did a really good job of taking him away. It's, it's really hard to do because the other guards are so good. Uh, 
when you do that, sometimes they beat you with the other four guys. And um, so, uh, but you can't let Buddy, he, he could go for 40. You know, he's a guy uh, I would think a, a LeBron James type, you better not let a guy like that go, go off on you. And so we're going to pay a lot of attention to him and hope we can limit his, his touches like most people have tried to do. Right here in the second row, please. Ola Buchanan, Texas. Hey, uh, Billy, how would you uh, describe or evaluate Daniel's uh, season, his performance to this point? I think he's had a good season. You know, uh, he, he, he hasn't had the, the greatest season compared to last year, how well he shot the ball from three. Um, but I think some of that has to do with the expectations that were on him. Uh, and him pressing too hard and trying too hard early on. I think recently he's done a better job of letting the game come to him. Um, but he's obviously had a he was sec second team all SEC. Um, last year he, he finished his first team. So, um, but, you know, he's done other things to help us win and not just rely on scoring. We got Josh right here. follow up on your answer earlier about the symptoms that you have. Yeah. Uh, what are they and how they impact your life? Um, I've got tightness. I get tight. Uh, and, and that's how I was diagnosed. I had stiffness in my shoulder and um, in Murray, Kentucky when I was coaching and the doctor said hey, it's an old football injury uh, maybe or athletic injury, bone spurs, coach, you're getting old. So I said, I, I'm getting old. So I kept lifting and working out and doing things and uh, took the job at A&M and, and I'd see a chiropractor and I'd feel good for a while and then it'd get tight again. And I changed my exercises and what I do lifting. And then I saw a doctor in, at A&M and it's been well written. Um, and they diagnosed me with the, the disease and uh, uh, about a year later, I started taking medication that has helped with the stiffness, and uh, that's really the gist of the the symptoms that I have at, at this point. We go on the third row in the orange shirt, yeah. please. Uh, Jerome Solomon from the Houston Chronicle. I guess part of my question was asked, but so I'll fall on the sword. Will you care to share with us your defensive approach and what you're going to do with Buddy? Uh, tomorrow night. Well, I'm, I'm not going to give you all my secrets. Uh, and, and it, it, you, you can't let him get transition baskets. You know, we, we need to get back and locate him early. That's the first thing. Um, and, and two, you can't leave him on an offensive rebound when they get one because he sprints behind the line as well as anybody and, and they find him. And, you know, we got to rotate guys on him and hope we can wear him down with two or three or four guys. Anyone else you guys have played this season who brings that dynamic to the game? Uh, the, the Murray kid at Kentucky is as good as in the country. You know, um, he was probably would prepare us for Buddy as well as anybody. We're going to go in the blue shirt on the right side here in the back, and then we got you. Richard Kroon, Brian Crunch, College Station Eagle. Coach, you guys have done a good job of, of I wouldn't say shutting down, but keeping the, the leading score below their average. I mean, are there just even generic keys to that that you could give us a hit on? I mean, we make a big deal about trying to know who the best two scorers are on the other team, and we game plan to try to limit those pretty much everybody we play against. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. The thing that makes Oklahoma so good is there are other guards They've got the green light too. I mean, they're very comfortable, and Coach Kruger's done an unbelievable job in investing uh, confidence in those guys, and uh, that's where they beat you. You know, you pay too much attention to Buddy. Then, lots uh, I've mentioned before, we played Oklahoma just a couple of years ago in the Toyota Center. Buddy had six, and we weren't guarding him any different than we would guard anybody else. And Jordan Woodard had 20. So uh, they, they're they're a good team. They've got other guys. Okay, we got two in the back. Do you have your hand up? Okay, we got you. You're on the list. Uh, Bob Kaiser, Orange County Register. Coach, uh, both teams are senior-dominated, start four seniors. It seems to be a trend this year in college basketball. Can you talk about how that develops when you have a team with that much experience? You know, seniors 
I, I was at Murray State a few years back, and we were the oldest team, I think, in the NCAA tournament when we beat Vandy up in San Jose. So maturity in, in older guys definitely helps because guys that have been in the system, guys who understand they're playing maybe their last college game and embrace the opportunity of playing in a tournament, embrace what the coach is telling them, um, I think that's a huge advantage um, in, in basketball. You know, all the way, you know, I, I, I'm a San Antonio Spurs fan, so I would say the Spurs, you know, a huge advantage with those guys being in that system for 17, 18 years. Uh, the Warriors kind of throw that out of that thought out of the, the, the water. But anyway, I, I think it's a huge advantage. Okay, we got about two minutes left. We got one question here and then one question up front. Time for Billy. Billy, several times this year, Jalen has come out maybe a little out of control, had some early turnovers. You've had to sit him down. How, how do you balance that, that passion with, with wanting him to, to be under control within what you're trying to do? Well, it hasn't just been Jalen, but uh, we've had a, our, our scores have a tendency of doing that. Uh, you know, I. The, the one thing is when I yank him out, he doesn't take it personal. You know, last year he, he got frustrated with it and, and um, didn't deal with it the right way. This year he's been much better at, at, at handling it. And we continue to talk about it. It's, you know, it's hard to – he is wired and motored a different way. Uh, and it's a great thing, but sometimes it can be – it hurts him. And sometimes it's best to bring him out and say, hey, man, you, you're going to sit here till you settle down and slow down. and. The bench has been a great uh, help for, for, for getting him right in that area. We'll go right here in the front row. Dean Blevins, News 9, Oklahoma City. Um, Coach, the scouting report on Oklahoma, at least with Big 12 teams, is to pressure them a lot. Uh, is that something that you guys have done a lot? Are you natural at doing that? or We're just... not a great ball pressure team, you know. Uh, we're more of a protect the paint, get back, make it beat us from the three-point line. That's that's what's going to be one of the key things is can we defend the three-point line better than we have in the past, and um, will they shoot it as well as they have? You know, uh, that's I think 40% of their offense is from the three-point line. They're either first or second in the country uh, from the three-point line, and. We have to do a better job defending the three-point line than we have. We're going to go to the last question. We'll be in the very back, please. Myron Patton Fox in Oklahoma City. What do you see as your strengths that you can ex maybe give you uh, that you can exploit against Oklahoma? What are your strengths? Strengths defensively, you said? Just as a just team in general. Uh, well, one, we got a 6'10", 275-pound center that needs to touch the ball, you know, and Tyler Davis, you know, is, he's a big body. We got to keep him out of foul trouble. He picked up two fouls against Northern Iowa in the first half, and that disrupted us offensively. Um, we have to be able to guard the ball screen uh, with him because he is big. They're going to pull him away from the basket, and uh, we're going to have to do a good job of of uh, guarding the three point line with our bigs when they have to step out. And then offensively, you know, we have to be able to be disciplined enough to make them guard us. Um, they're a good defensive team, but they want to play fast. They want to attack. And um, that's something we can do some offensively. We can play a variety of ways. But in this game, I think we have to be a little more disciplined offensively. Okay, with that, we're going to let Coach Kennedy go. Thank you very much, right, sir. Thank you. Just a reminder, everybody in the back, it's really hard to see you up here. So if you're sitting in the back, I might not see you waving your hands. So you might consider moving up closer to the front, make everybody's life a little easier. We'll be have we'll have the student athletes, Jalen Jones, Alex Caruso, and Daniel Daniel House up here in just a moment. All right, once again, we are joined by student athletes Jalen Jones, Alex Caruso, Daniel House. Uh, same procedure, we'll raise your hand. And a reminder, please direct your question to a specific uh, student athlete up here. 
That way we know who you want to talk to and I don't have to choose for you. We're going to have the very first question going to be right here and then we're going to go into the fourth row. This is for all three of the guys. If oh, you, sorry. Could you also identify yourself and your affiliation? Oh, I'm sorry. Start, Mark please. Canizaro from the New York Post. If all three of you guys can answer this, just I'm curious in your own ways how you've tried to uh, soak in what happened the other night but yet let it go and, and, and refocus for this and, you know, how difficult that's been, the challenge. I don't think that it was difficult. Uh, we watched film over it, and uh, we talked about it the next day, and then the next day we focused on Oklahoma. Yeah, I don't think it was as, as, uh, as hard for us to put it past, just knowing we had another game to play, as I think some of the fans did and some of the as media maybe. So, I mean, it was pretty easy for us knowing that we had another game to play and someone else to get ready for. Uh, we did a great job of getting past it, and our coaching staff did a great job of making sure we were locked in Oklahoma. And uh, we've just been watching a lot of film on Oklahoma and ready for, uh, and prepared for them. Okay, we're going to go to the fourth row here on the edge, and then we'll be right over here. Thanks for Alex. This is Mark Wicker from the LA Daily News. Um, what's it been like watching Tyler progress, especially from the first of the season? He says he wasn't in good enough shape to play with you guys when practice started. What, what's been that evolution like? Uh, it's been it's been really cool just to see how Tyler's come along, uh, going from where he probably spent 10 seconds in the paint every time down on offense to he's been able to move and, and kind of understand the game a little better. And just him coming along and being more aggressive, being more poised, uh, it's something that it took me maybe two or three years to kind of kind of get a grasp of to be a mature player. And he's, he's doing it a lot faster. So, I mean, obviously we wouldn't be where we would be uh, right now if he isn't playing how he is. Right here in the front row, please. Mike Metcalf, ESPN, for Alex and Daniel. Uh, Billy said that you guys made some mistakes that got you into that situation against Northern Iowa, and you can't repeat that. What did you see on film? What were some of the errors you made that you can't make against Oklahoma tomorrow? Oh, we weren't executing. We weren't making the right plays. Oh, we weren't. We was turning over the ball and um, and just shooting quick shots. Oh, we got to execute our offense and uh, make sure that we get the ball moving. Yeah, just, I mean, first half, our sense of urgency as a team, uh, defensively, offensively, we weren't aggressive enough. We kind of let them dictate everything that they wanted to do, how they wanted to play. Uh, and and they took advantage of it, held us 22 points, and then they scored 30-something. So, I mean, we played right into their hands. So just coming out, knowing Oklahoma is going to come out with, with a high sense of urgency, uh, we got to be aggressive and, and match that. Okay, we're going to go to right here in about the sixth row. Chip Howard, Sports Radio 1150 for Jalen. I, I visited with Coach Kennedy a few minutes ago, Jalen, about a few games this year where he has sat you down early because maybe you had had a couple of turnovers or weren't playing the way he wanted you to play. W would you discuss kind of those times? He said last year was a little tougher. This year you've kind of understood and, and maybe when you sit down and, and watch and, and see how things are going, you're, you're a little better when you come back in. Uh, I mean, it's a coach's decision on that. Uh, whenever he wants to take me out, he takes me out. And I feel confident about our bench coming in and replace me. Tony does a great job of coming in and giving us great minutes. Tavario does as well. So uh, when I'm on the bench, you know, I'm just seeing what I can do to help when I get back in the game. So uh, it's nothing about coming out the game. Uh, whenever he wants to take me out, he takes me out, and I accept it. Okay, we're going to go right here and then right behind you. Ryan Aber from the Oklahoma. And, uh, Jalen, for you, although Alex and, and Daniel, if you have anything to add, I'd, I'd love to hear it. When you were going through your recruiting process, how aware were you of Coach Kennedy's diagnosis? And was there any uh, trepidation as you considered Texas A&M? Uh, I was aware of his uh, disease. Um, but I came and visited the campus a few times and I always seen them working out and always eating right. So, I mean, I, that was never a concern for me. and. The players, I asked the players about it, and they said they never seen any effects from it. So that never had anything to do with me coming here, and I knew he would be ready to go. I felt pretty confident about his health. Anybody else want to comment? No? Okay, cool. We're going to go to the front row right here, please. Uh, for all three guys, obviously Buddy Hilde is, you know, one of the best players in the country. What do you have to do to try to slow him down, which, you know, both teams they face so far haven't been able to do that. 
Got to limit his touches. Uh, make sure he doesn't get in his sweet spots and start heating up from three pointers. And you always got to be alert, even when they miss a shot. He's always trying to run out to that three point line and get a quick one up. So it's just being alert and uh, make sure you always uh, stay in the chats to him and uh, just staying on him. Yeah, just making it hard as possible. Uh, really good player, obviously, uh, up for like every award this year. Uh, can heat up. You just got to do your best job to, to not let him catch it and, and hope he misses as much as possible. <laughs> Nothing at all? They, they said it all. Okay. <laughs> all right. Fair enough. All right. Uh, do we have any more, qu any more questions? Okay. We'll go right here, please. Gabe Bach, Tex Ags. Alex, as good as Buddy Hilde is, how important is it, too, not to forget about those other guys along the perimeter that shoot over 40%? Yeah, that's, that's something I think uh, – people are forgetting about a little bit is just that how how balanced their guard play is uh, with those other two guys, Cousins and Woodard. They're both experienced. They're both shooting like 40% from three, if not better. Uh, so it's not like you can shut down one guy and, and the rest of their team is going to fold. Uh, they're a really complete team. So, I mean, everybody else, whoever's not guarding, guarding Buddy, has to be just as aware and just as ready to play. Okay, hold on, let me look at my list here. Okay, so first one we're gonna go here in the orange shirt, then back to the front row, and then we're going back to this side. So I'm Solomon from the Houston Chronicle. Alex, you've been on campus for a long time and you saw some football mania when you first got there and this is the first run the basketball team has made in quite a while. Will you describe Aggieland this week for us? Uh, yeah, uh, got a lot of uh, smiles and congratulations in class on uh, Monday and Tuesday. Just everybody excited for us. Uh, they're making t-shirts like 44 seconds or something like that. Everybody's really uh, excited. Uh, but I mean, it's nothing we didn't expect as a team. So for, as far as we're, we're concerned, I mean, we're ready to play and uh, ready for, for all of Aggieland just to, to come and support us. Back to the front row, please. Uh, Myron Metcalf, you spin again for Jalen and Alex. When you see your coach fighting through, you know, a disease like that, what impact does that have on, on you and your teammates and just, you know, your work ethic, just seeing them go through that? Uh, just been supportive. Um, I was always check up on him and see how he's doing. And I mean, he's just always ready to go. I mean, he's full of energy all the time. I mean, he's calm and laid back and throughout the adversity and the crucial times throughout the game. I mean, he's just relaxed and chill about everything. So, I mean, I don't even think the disease really bothers him. I mean, he always seems like he's ready to go for everything. Yeah, just, just I mean, he's trying to he's trying to make us better before he's worried about himself every single day. He's trying to get us better as a team, us better as individual people and then players. So, I mean, just knowing that he has our back is really uh, is really reassuring and just brings us confidence as a team. We have on the center aisle, and then we're going to go over here to Mark. Daniel, you, you've played four Big 12 teams already this year. Do you see similarities in, in how Oklahoma plays with some of these other Big 12 teams, or is there another team that you've played that you can compare how the Sooners play? Oh, that's that's tough. Uh, you can't compare any team, so we really haven't seen any matchup like this. So we gotta take uh, take every step slowly and pay attention to every little detail because every team is different, and especially with it with the running the the candidate player national national of the year. So you gotta take everything carefully. You gotta focus in on details and, and follow the game plan. We'll go Mark right here, please. Mark Wicker, LA Daily News. This is for Alex. I know you've watched and followed Aggie basketball for a long time. Do you, where were you when uh, A&M lost that last second game to UCLA in this building uh, in 2008? And what do you remember about that? Uh, I remember the picture on the front of the paper the next day when he got fouled and everybody being mad about it. Uh, but I mean, I was, I was somewhere. I was probably playing basketball that day. And then I probably watched the game and then was probably upset for about a week. Uh, but I mean, I'm just, I'm just ready to, to go out there and play. Uh, get some redemption for the, the Honda Center. We go next to the last row back, please. Alex, Karen Krauss with the New York Times, continuing the t-shirt thread from earlier. When you get back home, will you add that t-shirt to your collection, the 44 seconds? Will you make sure you get one? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to. Uh, that's not something that I think I'm going to ever forget, so I'm going to have to get some type of memorabilia or some memento for that. We'll go right here in the middle, please. Dean Blevins, CBS Oklahoma City. Um, guys, how much confidence does uh, beating Big 12 teams like you did this season uh, give you going into this game? 
Um, yeah, I mean, it, gives, it obviously gives you a lot of confidence, but I think as a team, we're confident against any time, any team that we play against. But being four and zero against the Big Twelve definitely gives us a lot of confidence, and uh, we'll definitely be ready to go. Yeah, just I mean, we're a confident group in the Sweet Sixteen. You got to be doing something right. So I mean, we're ready to go out and play. Uh, know that Oklahoma's fought and battled with those teams we've beaten already, but they they have something different about them. They've They've been playing really good all year, pretty consistent. So just got to be ready to go out and play. Any further questions? Last call. All right, thank you, gentlemen. We're about two minutes away from having Oklahoma student athletes, Ryan Spangler, Isaiah Cousins, and Buddy Heald. That'll be from 130 to 145. Then at 145, we'll have Oklahoma coach Lon Kruger. Just a reminder, once again, it's really dark in the back of the room. So if you're back there asking questions, it's hard to see you. I really recommend you move up to the front. That way I can make sure I get to see you and can call on you. Once again, I'm going to remind everybody, if you could, please specifically call on a person. If it's, even if it's for everybody, like, for example, if you want to hear Buddy Heald's comments on how to attack the A&M, but you want to hear everybody's, specify it to one person first. It'll just make it a lot easier for everybody, especially our, our friends at Hammonds back there. So. All right, we are joined by student athletes Ryan Spangler, Isaiah Cousins, and Buddy Heald. We're going to open it straight up to questions. Our first question is going to come in the front row right here, please. Myron Mack at ESPN. Uh, for Buddy and, and Ryan, your teammate Man Yang has been out. Uh, his brother uh, died. Uh, what has it been like for you all? How have you all handled that? And how have you all supported him, starting with Buddy? Uh, you know, AK is an important part of team, for this team. And uh, as you see the last the first game, you know, he really helped us in how, how we, his presence down in the paint and how he blocked shots and rebound for us. And uh, I know it's sad story happened to his brother, but uh, it fueled us in that VCU game, you know, we're playing for him. And I make sure that, you know, we're still family and uh, we are there just, you know, thinking about him and uh, we're trying to stay alive until he gets back in this tournament so he can help us out. Kind of like, kind of like Buddy he said, uh, you know, there's, there's more important things in life than basketball. and. And uh, we realize that, and, and uh, so just trying to, you know, talk to him and, and make sure we text him every day and let him know that, you know, we still care about him. Questions for the student athletes? We'll go right here in the third row, please. Uh, Ryan Karchi, Orange County Register. Uh, buddy, your three-point percentage, I think, is up over 10% uh, this year from last year. What was the biggest difference for you trying to improve your shooting from long range from then to now? I was just getting up out of reps and uh, just taking uh, smaller shots and fishing shots that I'm normally used to making, and that's 
jacking up threes, and uh, that's what kills my percentage. So uh, just taking shots in rhythm and uh, being smart when I select them too, even though I still take bad ones. Go right here, please. Myron, uh, Myron Patton, Fox 45, Oklahoma City. Um, buddy, what do you see when you watch A&M in terms of things that you're going to have to deal with as a team? What, what stint jumps out at you? Uh, you know, they're a big team. Yeah, they pound inside the side really good. And uh, I just feel like if we, if we just stay focused and uh, execute on defense and uh, push the ball in transition, I think we'll be good. Right, we got right here, and then we'll go back to the third row. Hi, Mike. <clears throat> Mike DiGiovanna with the LA Times. Question for Buddy. Um, how did your upbringing in the Bahamas shape not only the player, but the person you are today? Uh, just the way how I was raised with my mom, around my brothers and sisters, and, uh, you know, we all had similar personalities, just living a fun life. No matter if we have nothing or something, you know, we just make the best of anything we had. And, uh, you know, when I go on the court, I just use that to motivate me so one day I be able to help my family out and make and uh, have a better way of life. We're going to go here and then back to the front row and then back there. Uh, Ryan Carchi, OC Red Shirt. Uh, Isaiah, I read that, that you've been a part of more than a few of Buddy's all-hour shooting sessions. What are what are those like? Um, it's, it's a lot of hard work. Um, there's a lot of reps of just shooting and just uh, being in the gym constantly, uh, like two days and just really being in the gym just for like hours just to just to get better. We'll go here in the front row, please. Buddy, I believe uh, with the three of you and Jordan, you have 102 consecutive starts together. How much confidence does that give you uh, when you're in a situation, a tough situation like you were in against VCU? You know, we know what each other is capable of doing. You know, uh, we're comfortable doing. You know, uh, just when everybody's in the court, we feel comfortable and uh, we can be relaxed. And uh, you know, if coach call our number. We know how to get pick and roll, and we know what Ryan likes, and, I, and Isaiah and how to get the ball to me, and how to get the ball to Isaiah. So that's helping to feel each other and uh, knowing each other's spots on the court. We'll go about six row back on the aisle, please. Ryan, Chip Howard, Sports Radio 1150. Speak to A&M's inside game, and especially uh, Tyler Davis in the middle. Yeah, he's a, he's a big body. Uh, you know, he likes to post up in there, and they get the ball to him pretty well. And and, uh, you know, that's something we've been working on the last couple of days of practice. And, and so me and Kadeem, to start it off, we'll have to, uh, you know, fight him and not let him get anything easy. And, and when guys come off the bench, they got to do the same thing. So so on him, just, just try not to let him get easy buckets, uh, make him earn everything. Right across the aisle there. Richard Kroon, Brian College Station Eagle. Buddy, can you talk a little bit about the relationship or your connection with Tavario Miller with a &M? Oh, I, I know Tavario for a little bit. Uh, I remember he came down to the Bahamas, and uh, he moved from his island. He came down to Freeport, and uh, he's he was a big kid, and uh, he just known from there. He was nice, always nice, until he moved to Nassau. But when he came to America, I got to play. I got to play against him. So uh, we also had a good relationship. It's never talking back and forth, constant. But uh, we know of each other, and uh, we just remember each other from back home. There's nothing really serious about it. Right here in the third row. Buddy, I've read that, you know, in these shooting sessions that you have, they usually just go by feel. You don't go with a number set of shots. Is that a feel that you've sort of developed more over the, these last few years? You might know yourself in terms of being a shooter? Yes, for sure. Just being in the gym, you know, I don't try to get a number of reps. I just, until I feel comfortable, uh, it might take you about an hour or two hours to shoot inside the gym until I feel comfortable and I feel, until my body feels right, I'm going to pick up and leave. Okay, we're going to go here, and then we'll have two on this side. Ron, you guys played uh, A&M a couple of years ago in the Big 12 SEC Challenge. Do you take anything from that that you've learned that maybe you can – that will help you tomorrow night? Yeah, that that game's kind of hard to remember. It was – I think it was our first year here. But, but uh, you know, I remember they're, they're always big, and, and they throw it inside a lot. And, and uh, their point guard, you know, we played him before, so, so we know what he likes to do. And – but the, the main thing is just, you know, play our game and, and uh, play defense the way we can and, and move the ball and we'll be fine. Back to the front row, please. Uh, for, for Ryan, uh, what do you all miss with Man Yang out? Obviously, this is a big team that you're facing. Uh, what impact does his absence have on this team? Extra body, you know, big body. Uh, finish around the rim, block shots, uh, alter shots, and, 
And, uh, you know, we've been missing that in practice the last couple of days. Uh, we've been throwing way more oops in practice that we never get when he's there. And, and I think that just shows, you know, the impact he has. So so I think, you know, when it comes to the game time, just, just having that extra body just in case, you know, foul trouble or, or whatever happens and, and uh, just being able to put him in there. Right here in the third row in the orange shirt, please. Yeah, Jerome Solomon from the Houston Chronicle. Buddy, you know, Ryan talked about that game against a a couple of years ago. They had a lot of success on you defensively, individually. How different a player are you now, and what style of play do you bring that you didn't have or parts of your game that you didn't have back then? Oh, I, I was just a shooter back then, and I never attacked. When, uh, I had a lot of good looks during that game. I, I just missed shots that game. But uh, uh, I'm just more different. Uh, I'm not attack it off the dribble and create my own shot. So it's a different type of style they'll see this time from me. Going in the back here. Isaiah, uh, when you see a team come from behind the way A&M won their last game, what do you take from that in terms of, like, if you have a lead and <laughs> trying to increase that lead? Because sometimes if you get a big lead, the tendency is to kind of slack off a little bit. Um, the main thing, just uh, take care of the ball. Um, every possession and every time you get the ball, uh, make sure you get a good shot um, and just not be careless with the ball. And, um, just be very focused on offense, just uh, moving the ball and just looking for teammates uh, and they just get ready for to make some shots. We're going to go back to Ryan here. Buddy, your work ethic has been pretty well documented at this point. Where did that start for you? Is that something that from your upbringing, someone in particular that, that instilled that in you? Yeah, and it was, uh, just just being in the park a lot. No. You know, you know, you'll hear a story of me building my own court and stuff. Just wanted to be out there and just play. And, uh, and I feel I hear a lot of rumors for Kobe Bryant and much work he put in. So I just, like, try to instill it in my body. And I meditate on that. And I just work as, put as much work as I put in. I feel like I can get better. And I, the results are showing the court. Back here on the aisle, please. Hey, guys. I'm Mark Canizaro from the New York Post. For all three of you, can you give me what your reaction was when you saw what A&M did uh, la the, other, the other night, whether it was on Sports Center or, or you know, whether on film or whatever, and just, you know, something that's never been done before? Ryan, let's start with you and work our way down. Yeah, it was it was crazy. Uh, they never quit. Uh, never thought they were out of the game. And, and uh, so that, you know, that, that gives us something to work for. And, and uh, if we do get a lead, uh, Tomorrow, just know that they're not going to let up. Isaiah? Um, I didn't really see it, but I, I heard about it, and uh, I just <laughs> I just, I just, just feel that um, it just helps us get ready, prepare for them, and just just uh, lock in on take care of the ball and um, just being ready for it, them throwing the press at you. Buddy? Uh, I, I got to watch it, and uh, it was crazy. You know, what, what they did was – Remarkable, and I uh, respect their fight. And, uh, you know, now when we play them, you, you know, forget about a big lead. We can't take that lead for granted because uh, we know they're capable of making a run. Okay, we're going to go right here first, and then you got you. Buddy, is your mom going to be here this weekend? And if so, is she going to hang around for the end of these games? Uh, if, if it's close, she's not going to hang around. She's going to go upstairs and pray. But she's going to be here for sure, no doubt. Wait, hold on. G give him the mic back so he can finish. What do you think of that, the fact that she has left her seat at the end of these games? She's always like that from my mom. When I was in the Bahamas and, like, and like the junior high games and stuff like that, when the games get tight, you never find the gym. She's walking out. And uh, every time she walks out, something big's happening and uh, something good happens. So whatever she's doing, she needs to keep doing it because uh, it helps us a lot. Go right here and then back to the front row. Ryan, uh, how much has, has Buddy just being around kind of brought in that culture of the Bahamas. I mean, for obviously as a as a native southerner and I'm sure that's a pretty big difference, but I've heard about, you know, reggae at and shooting sessions stuff like that. H how much have you seen that culture, uh, especially with Buddy being around? A lot, you know, uh every time you walk in the gym, if you know if Buddy's there by the music he's playing, uh you'll probably hear him on the court tomorrow scream if he's open. He does a little scream and man, he's got some sayings that, that a lot of people pick up, but but uh you know, I think, you know, I don't know, he's, he's a good guy and, and uh, you know, he makes everybody smile around him and, and uh, he's a good basketball player, but I think he's a, a better guy. 
What kind of sayings? Is don't, that? don't worry about that. <laughs> All right, here, we're going to go right back to the front row, please. Uh, for Buddy and Isaiah, I'll start with Buddy. How much did, you know, playing a team like West Virginia help you to prepare to play a Texas A&M squad that did press Northern Iowa in final minutes and did a great job of really changing the pace of the game when they did it? Uh, it helped us a lot, and uh, I feel like VCU helped us a lot, too. West Virginia helped us with VCU because we know VCU is aggressive, and uh, they have sim a lot of similarities. So, uh, you know, we see what Texas A&M do. You know, we have guys and we have coaches that get us well prepared for games like this. You know, you have Isaiah running the point, and uh, guys like Jordan backing them up. So uh, I feel like we're ready for this, and uh, no, 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 no subscribe to them. But uh, West Virginia is probably the best pressing team in the country, so uh, I don't think there's, there shouldn't be nothing we haven't seen before. Um, playing West Virginia definitely helps us because uh, how physical and how uh, aggressive they are like during the press and um, how much they pride themselves on just getting deflections and uh, constantly, consistently, um, always uh, attacking you. And I think I think just by us handling handling it during the season will, will definitely help us a lot. Go right here in the fifth row, please. Like uh, all of you guys' answers, maybe start with Ryan first. You guys have been really consistent this year. How does the team compare from a confidence mood standpoint to this time last year when you were in the Sweet 16? Yeah, we're, we're high in confidence right now. Uh, like you said, we had a good year, and, and uh, we feel good about the way we're playing right now. And I and, uh, can't really remember much from last year. I just know that, that we learned from the Sweet 16 game last year, and, and uh, now we know what to do and what not to do. Isaiah? Um, I think our confidence is high. Um, last year, we, we, we took a loss, and uh, that's just going to give us a lot of motivation and confidence to just finish out the ball game and just come just ready to play, f play like our last. Uh, like Isaiah said, you know, uh, we know where we were at last year, and uh, now we're just more confident, ready to finish where we had started last year and uh, execute down the stretch and uh, rebound the ball like we should and uh, just go out there, compete, and have no regrets when we leave the court. Okay, we've got about a minute left. Any further questions? Last call. All right, thank you, gentlemen. And we'll have Coach Long Kruger up here in just a moment. Once again, just for those of you who've joined us, we have two microphone holders. We have Shane and Sean. I'm going to call on you in the order that I see you. So uh, please come up towards the front. If you plan on asking questions, we'll make it easier for everybody. Uh, we'll open it up with a statement from Coach Kruger and then open it up to questions. Coach, welcome to Anaheim. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, NCAA tournament, uh, the great time of year. Uh, happy for our guys. Uh, it's hard to win games in the tournament, so to win a couple to be here, uh, really proud for them. And uh, Keep reminding them not to take uh, any of that for granted and uh, enjoy it. And a uh, tough opponent coming up uh, tomorrow. a and a good ball club. Coach Kennedy does a terrific job. They're big. They do a lot of things well on both ends of the floor. And uh, we know we'll have to play well to have a chance. We're going to start in the front row right here, please. Meyer Metcalf, ESPN. Uh, Coach, what's the latest on Man Yang? And have you had a chance to talk to him? And how is he doing right now? He's, he's struggling. It is a tough tragedy, uh, you know, losing a family member like that. Uh, everyone deals with it in a different way. Uh, those uh, services are not until Saturday, so we'll not have him this week at all. Uh, but uh, certainly thinking about him and his teammates are, and coaches are in contact with him constantly. But, you know, only uh, wish we could do more. But uh, it's a tough situation for him. We have in the back on the aisle on the right, please. Coach Chip Howard, Sports Radio 1150. What jumps out at you immediately when you turn on the tape and look at Texas A&M? They've got a lot of good players. Uh, they they, they uh, are big. Their wings are big. Uh, Davis is, uh, you know, probably does as good a job with low post positioning as anyone we've played this year. Uh, um, you know, their guard plays very good. They're defensively, they're, they're sound. Uh, Coach Kennedy's teams are always uh, – you know, well-disciplined, tough defensively, good spacing offensively. They can score in a lot of different ways. Just a really good team. Go here in the fourth row in the blue, please. 
Yeah, Alon, Gabe Bach with Texags. What did you notice? What jumped out at you from A&M's comeback? And what kind of to coaching tool can you take from that moving forward? How, how do you think that got your players' attention? We actually, uh, at halftime, left the, uh, the game in Oklahoma City and drove back to Norman. And we're watching the last 10, 12 minutes from our locker room together with the team. And with a couple of minutes to go, uh, everyone kind of said, okay, we're going our separate ways and, and uh, uh, expecting to be Northern Iowa at that point. Uh, and then I listened to, uh, I left also, and I listened to the last, uh, the comeback on radio, driving home, and then uh, watched the overtimes uh, from home. But, uh, you know, it was a great comeback. Uh, they, they stayed after it. They didn't give up. They kept working, kept plugging. Uh, Got to respect that. Uh, uh, again, either, either team was going to be a tough challenge, and certainly A&M uh, will be. We got six row right here on the far left. Uh, Mike Tierney, New York Times. Lon, can you, uh, regarding the comeback, uh, you, you had one yourself at a previous school. Can you put in perspective how difficult that was for them? And might there have been a time in your career earlier before your experience where you would have said, this ain't happening, we're going to substitute <laughs> or whatever? Your first thought is uh, for the Northern Iowa coaches and, and players. You know, you know how difficult that is when that happens. Uh, it's a hard thing to get over. And uh, then the second thought is again applaud A and M for staying after it. They uh, did a good job. Uh, I think with whatever 44 seconds to go, down down 10 or down 12. Uh, you know, certainly it'd be pretty easy to start subbing. And you know, not not necessarily the NCAA tournament. You know, I think you you, know, you, you leave you know you go to the last second in that case but uh, typically on the year you know uh, I think after that game probably uh, people won't be subbing for a while they'll, they'll, they'll think they've got a chance we're going to go here in the front row and then we'll have three on the left side uh, Coach actually players about this as well but how do you think playing teams like West Virginia uh, have helped you prepare for a squad like Texas A&M Texas that pressed late in that Northern Iowa game and could do the same uh, against your squad tomorrow yeah, in the Big 12, you play all different styles. Uh, certainly, West Virginia is a pressing, uh, pressing team. Uh, you know, A&M uh, you know, typically doesn't press like that. Uh, you know, they're down late, of course, they will. Um, but yeah, it, the Big 12 prepares you for a lot of different things, and, and West Virginia's press certainly uh, as good as any in the country. Right here in the sixth row on the left, please. Myron Patton Fox in Oklahoma City. What are some key things that you need to do against A&M? This is pretty long. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're big. You know, rebounding is always a, a critical spot for us. We, uh, you know, uh, we'll rebound well for a half and then not well for a half. Uh, we've got to have 40 minutes of, of good focused effort on the boards. Uh, you know, they're inside guys. Uh, they can post their guards. Uh, post Davis, of course, uh, really tough on the interiors. So we've got to have five guys aware and uh, give good help in there. Uh, you know, we'd like to get ours in transition. We'd like to be some pace to the game. Uh, and try to limit them in transition, and still they're pretty good in transition as well. So, you know, we've got to get it going downhill a little bit, drive and kick, make plays for each other, and uh, nothing different uh, really from what we always try to do. But uh, A&M, uh, you know, may pose some opposition to that. Where are you? you two gentlemen in the back, and then we'll come up to you. Richard Kroon, Brian Collins, Station Eagle. Coach, A&M has done a really good job of uh, maybe not shutting down, but slowing down the leading score for the other team. Uh, guys like Stephon Moody, um, you know, even Jamal Murray a little bit. Um, can you, and Niang, can you talk a little bit from maybe what you've seen on why they're able to do this or, you know, what their concentration is maybe? Well, they've got good players. They've got good defensive players. They've got a good team scheme in terms of uh, fundamentally they support each other very well. Uh, uh, so if you're good on the ball and you've got good support, then uh, that's why they're good defensively. Uh, they uh, – uh, got good size, uh, you know. You, you can't really isolate any of them in terms of a mismatch. Um, they're just it's really good defensively. Right behind you, go ahead, Coach. What kind of advantage do you think it is that your guys were in this position a year ago? A, a and M, even though they have seniors, this is their first tournament run. They, they have not experienced this before. Do, do you feel like that's a little bit of an advantage? I think the advantage we we received from that was uh, just a feeling we had. I think was motivating during the. The spring, summer, fall workouts. I think you know, losing at that point where you, you know, are close, but but you go home instead. I think that uh, you know had our guys better focused during the off season to to improve, make progress, uh, work at it. I don't think either team will be thinking about it tomorrow. 
Uh, don't see a big difference there, but uh, I, think it, I think it was motivating for us in, in the off season. Right here in the fourth row, thanks for your patience. Yeah, Lon, Billy Kennedy said after the win on Sunday that he considers you something of a mentor. Can you share with us some background on that? I've just been a big fan of Billy's from, uh, you know, from his days uh, early on. He's always done a good job. I've always thought his teams played good basketball. Uh, they were very sound defensively. They spaced the floor well offensively. I thought they played the game the right way. Uh, just always respected uh, how he did things. And, and I guess during the course of a year after a big win, you know, I'd, I'd send him a note and congratulate him, and he'd do the same back. And so we've had that type of relationship. Uh, I think uh, certainly we've had a great deal of respect for how he does things. We're going to go right here to the front row. Lon, you're obviously playing the Texas A&M squad that's been pretty dominant in the paint throughout the NCAA tournament. Uh, how does Man Yang's absence affect your front court depth going into that game? Yeah, typically, we have uh, between uh, Kadeem uh, Latin and Jamani McNeese and, and AK Man Yang, you know, kind of three guys that rotate in there. And uh, without AK, then then that becomes two, and we may may slide Ryan Spangler in there a little bit um, as the third guy. But uh, so it hurts a little bit from that rotation standpoint. But uh, we understand uh, the difficulty for AK and, and certainly, um, you know, just move on from it. Go in the hat right there, please. Joey Helmer, OUinsider.com. Coach, in the last game, uh, you guys uh, got off to a fast start and uh, really got the crowd energized, home crowd. Obviously, you won't be in front of your uh, home crowd this time, but how important is it going to be uh, to get off to another fast start in a, a big game like this? Always prefer that, uh, for sure, and especially in, in the tournament. Uh, you like playing with, you know, from the lead uh, with a margin. Uh, typically, you know, when uh, you're playing a good team, there's going to be, uh, you know, good stretches, poor stretches. Uh, anytime you can uh, have a little margin to play with, in anticipation of that stretch where the other team gets it going, um, is, is better. Uh, uh, so anytime you get off to a good start, you like doing that. Right over here on the left, please. Well, Steve Mims from the Register Garden, Eugene. Dana Altman, obviously you gave him sort of his first break in the business. Can you kind of reflect on kind of what you knew of him to, to hire him at K-State and, and kind of what he was like in his early days coaching with you? Yeah, Dana's always been fantastic. Uh, you know, really, really good guy, uh, terrific basketball coach. Uh, I think he's done clearly the, you know, maybe he and Bill Self, the two guys in the country this year that have done the best job. Uh, when I watched Oregon play, uh, you know, I talked to Dana about every 10 days or so throughout the year, and, and uh, just uh, many times I said over the last two months, uh, I think you're the best team in the country. I think you've got your guys playing uh, freely with confidence, uh, moving the ball, uh, they're versatile, and um, he just kept winning, and I kept saying that. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, he's done a great job. He, he's just done a terrific job. Any further questions? Last call. All right. Thanks, Coach Kruger. Thank you. Thanks. Sure thing. Thank you. All right. It's 1.55. Our next press conference will start at 2 o'clock with Duke. At 2.15, student, Allen, student, Allen, student athletes, Grayson Allen, Matt Jones, and Marshall Plumley. At 2.30, we'll have Oregon student athletes. We don't know who yet, but we will get that to you shortly.
All right, we're about two minutes away from having Duke head coach Mike Krzyzewski up here. Uh, just a few reminders for those of you who are just joining us on this part of the interview. Uh, Julie St. Cyr up here in the front row is your interview room coordinator. I'm going to ask everybody, please check your cell phones, make sure they are turned off or at least set to silent. Uh, we have our two microphone holders, Shane and Sean. Please raise your hand. I call on you in the order that I see you uh, as best I can. Uh, if you're going to plan on asking questions, I encourage you to come sit up front where it's more light, it's easier to see you, and it's more likely I won't miss you. A uh, reminder that per the NCAA, no cell phones or tablets are permitted to film or record interviews in the interview area. Our pool reporter is Ed Graney of the Las Vegas Review Journal, and the full transcripts of the press conferences are available in the media room and actually have been distributed uh, shortly after the press conference. A uh, reminder as you're asking your questions, when we're asking to questions to student athletes, I'm going to ask you to please direct it to a specific student athlete, even if you want to answer every, everybody on the dais to answer. Really appreciate it if you'd point it at somebody first, and then we can work our way down. Um, we'll start it off with Coach Krzyzewski with a statement from Coach Krzyzewski, and then open up to questions for the floor. We'll go 15 minutes, and then we'll have the student athletes up there. Any questions? All right, we're about 30 seconds away. I don't know which one I recognize my <laughs> name's good. All right, so we are joined by Duke head coach Mike Krzyzewski. We'll open up with a statement from coach and then open up to questions. Coach, welcome Yeah, to well, thank you. It's great to be in Anaheim and uh, great to be in the Sweet 16. I'm, I'm proud of our team. You know, they've done a great job for us this year. Uh, young, kind of limited in numbers, but... Uh, uh, they've really grown tough together and have earned their way here. Uh, you know, Health-wise, we're as healthy as we can be right now. And, you know, obviously, Emil Jefferson is out for the year. And um, uh, Matt still, you know, when he sprained his ankle against North Carolina in the final uh, regular season game, he, he's not uh, – Actually, he sprained it a little bit again in North Carolina. He sprained it against uh, uh, in that first one. And he hasn't yet completely recovered, but he's, he's good enough to go, so we're ready to go. All right, we're going to start here in the front row, and then we've got two on this side. Uh, Myron Metcalf, ESPN. I, I believe I read that uh, Duke is 0-4 in the Pacific time zone. How much have you thought about that, consider that entering this game. You know what, it's interesting with ESPN. Every time I look at the ticker, it's something we haven't done. So we've won 90 games in the NCAA. And uh, yeah, I've never been one to look at what I do on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or whatever. I've, I've looked at what we've done cumulative. And so it's our 23rd Sweet 16. Yeah, we've been in 116 NCAA games, and we're honored like crazy to be in here. And I, I really don't think it makes a damn bit of difference what we've done on the West Coast before. And if we started to compete because of Mondays, Tuesdays, and West Coast, I don't think we ever would have had five national championships and 12 Final Fours. So I know it's probably a longer answer than you might want, but that's the way I look at those things. I think they don't mean a damn thing, all right? Okay, we have 10 questions. Who we up play now. now means a lot. And who we have to play at that time means a lot. So we're going to go right here in the third row, please. My, Mark Wicker from the LA Daily News. Uh, what's it been like coaching the Plumleys? How are they different personality-wise from each other? Yeah. And what, what is your perspective of what went into his decision to, to go into the Army when his basketball is done? Well, the, coaching the Plumleys has been terrific because all three of them are – outstanding guys and and really good players each of them improved uh, I think the youngster who's improved the most is the one I have right now in in Marshall uh, but uh, athletically you know Miles and Mason are terrific Marshall's a, a really good athlete but he's made himself a really good player 
uh, I, uh, they come to work every day. And they're, they're great team guys. And so we're going to miss them. I'm mad at Perky and Wesley for not having more. Uh, but uh, imagine three seven-footers in one family and all what a great family. We've, we've, been, we've benefited greatly from that. Have I missed what? what? Yeah, well, you know, he got turned on to the military um, well over almost two years ago. One of my former players, Bob Brown from West Point, is a three-star general, and he met him and Marty Dempsey, who's the former chair of the Joint Chiefs. And uh, Bob invited him down to Fort Benning when he was uh, in command at one of the uh, units there and uh, had him participate, thing, and, and Marshall loved it. And they've created an opportunity for him with ROTC at, at Duke. And what will, you know, he's already graduated. He's in graduate school where if he does have the opportunity to play professionally, he could be in the reserves. Uh, and then whenever, whenever professional basketball would stop, he would want to be in the service of our country. I'm really proud of Marshall. You know, he's, and he's helped us. Marshall's been our most important player. And I think the military stuff has really helped him in that regard. Okay, go ahead right there. Mike, Steve Mims from the Register Guard newspaper and Eugene. You just talk about what you've seen out of Oregon, and is that a team that kind of as the season went on and they moved up the rankings, have you seen them or, or seen much of them coming through? You know, we don't watch, you know, you watch your own neighborhood. And, uh, and even then, you don't watch your own neighborhood unless you're going to play them. So you watch your conference. Uh, I know of Oregon. Actually, uh, Josh Jamison, who's on the staff, was uh, – uh, used to work with Kyle Singler. So, you know, we've known the Oregon program. Dana, obviously, is an outstanding coach. Uh, uh, what I have learned a lot in watching them now is just uh, how athletic they are. You know, they basically have seven starters. And uh, they play off each other really well. They rebound. They play with a great verve. Uh, you know, they're, they're – they're a unique team because they don't necessarily have that traditional low post presence. One of their better three-point shooters uh, is their top shot blocker. <laughs> and I'm not sure that – I'm not sure anybody has that. And uh, so they're unique in that regard. But they share the ball well. They play hard. And they want a, an outstanding conference, you know, to, you know, to win the Pac-12 this year. The Pac-12 was really good. And – for them to win uh, shows just how good they were for the whole season. We're going to go right here. Uh, Coach, Brian Pollock with the Duke Chronicle. Talking about Oregon, now that you've had a little chance to look at them more, uh, is there any team with their athleticism uh, within the ACC or on your schedule that they remind you of at all? A little bit of Miami. You know, Miami has that depth of athleticism and old. And uh, a little bit, a little bit. But they, they're unique. You know, uh, where Jakiri doesn't shoot threes. Uh, Boucher and Bell, they, you know, they can, they can score and they protect the basket real well. And there are not many teams that can be wide athletically where you have, you know, you can, you can do that and play up and down too. In other words, they block shots. So that's one of the things that makes them so, so tough is they can be so athletic going side to side, and if they do get beat, they have two guys who protect, uh, protect the basket really well. So it makes it a little more difficult to score against them. We're going to go all the way to the very back. Jermaine Franklin with TSN. Coach, um, can you talk a little bit about the challenges that Dylan Brooks should present? Yeah, well, he's, their, I think, their best player. And uh, probably as versatile a player as, as I've seen I'm not saying the most because Brogdon, you know, we, we've seen a lot. But he's in that category of just really versatile because he, he does everything. He, he, he rebounds, he defends, he can hit threes, he gets fouled, he, he does everything. And he's the matchup that I think a lot of teams have had problems with. Uh, and then Dana does a great job of putting him in a position where he can take advantage of matchups. I think they do a really good job of that. 
and uh, and then he's a, he's he's a tough matchup for us. We know Bob right there, please. I think that's Bob. Uh, Bob Kaiser, Orange County Register. He was right. So it was pretty <laughs> uh, good. The other three teams in the tournament are very senior oriented, and you're clearly the youngest team here. Is that relevant when you get to this point? Yeah, it is. You know, we have three kids of our seven who are 18, but they've also you now played 35 games, and so they're old, an old 18. They're almost 19, and uh, and then we played in I think the, the conference that top to bottom was the best in the country this year. And so you learn by winning and losing and being in those in those situations. But so uh, um, I'm. I'm really proud of my guys for what they've accomplished thus far, but um, yeah, I'm also uh, I'm also on them to do more. You know, we we believe that uh, we can do more, and that's something with youth. Youth believes it has endless opportunities. People who are older or players who are older know that this might be their only opportunity their last opportunity. So we hope that what Marshall can bring and bringing that sense of urgency to the younger guys, it, it's helped and hopefully the message will still resonate with the, the rest of the team. Okay, we got a couple here on the left, you first. Brent Zorneman, Houston Chronicle. In, a, in an era where all kids love Steph Curry, how do you remind your guys to not necessarily play like Steph Curry, to stay within? No, the I'd team? like them to play like, I've coached stuff twice, and uh, if they want, if they can play like that, that'd be cool, man. Uh, would be a lot better. No, I mean, you know, I think Steph is a great example of preparation and consistent preparation and love of the game. You know, you see it manifested in his talents and what he does, but the preparation that he has and the attitude that he has on a day-to-day -day basis to do his best are, are amazing examples for, for kids. I think he's an amazing example for constant improvement, constant love of the game, constant uh, uh, hunger to show that they can, he can do it again, never satisfied. All those things are alive and well with Steph Curry. And those are great examples for, for our guys to watch. And, uh, so we, we like when, they, when they, they watch him. Okay, we're gonna go to the fourth row right in the middle here, please. Hi coach, uh, Dylan Hernandez with the LA Times. Uh, last night at Staples Center after the game, the Lakers game, uh, Kobe Bryant was talking about the one and done rule and saying he didn't think it made any sense. I know you've expressed opinions in the past, uh, you know, voicing your displeasure about that rule also. Uh, kind of a two part question here. Uh, one, how has that rule, uh, you know, affected the way you build a team? Uh, and two, uh, you know, short of changing the rule, Adam Silver uh, spoke last night and kind of made it sound like that wasn't, you know, he wasn't in favor of changing it. Well, um, he is in favor. Of He's come out and said, or said he two wants years. To, right, but he yeah. said at the same time that he recognizes the reality right. that kids have to make a living and stuff. And so it kind of sounded like it wasn't going to change. Um, so given that, um, you know, and given that they've kind of pretty much dropped any pretense that you guys are, you know, that college basketball is kind of a farm system, for the NBA, do you feel that there's anything that the NBA could do to help make the situation workable for you you guys short of against change? Well, I think role? the NBA has tried. You know, it's it's not just the NBA, it's the players' union. I mean, there it, it comes about in the collective bargaining agreement. And so it's both parties have to come come to grips with what's good for them. You know, when they're looking at things, they should be looking at what's good for them. And then what the NCAA should have is somebody, a face who's in charge of college basketball, who would meet with the head of the players' union, who would meet with Adam Silver, and express the concerns of our collegiate community and work in concert. The fact that we don't have anybody like that and have never had anybody like that, we pay a price for that. And because then we don't give them input and they, we, they don't have the feedback that they need to have to help make uh, maybe decisions that would help us. The one, it, we, it is what it is. You know, my, I personally would like to see if a kid is good enough to go right out of high school because they have the, a dog's life. 
You know, they don't, they're not doctors, lawyers, and coaches, and people, writers who can, you know, write forever and coach forever. They do it in about a 12 to 15 year span. And so if you're that good, if you were in entertainment, you'd already have stuff out there. If you were in tennis, if you were in a bunch of different sports, you'd be out there. And, uh, uh, but if not, I'd like to see them stay for two years uh, because then they can gain the maturity and be halfway towards a degree. And, uh, but that, that won't happen. So it is, yeah, we're, we're going to go with what it is. To build a team is more difficult. Uh, although the guys who don't get a one-and-done player would say, man, I'd like to have that one-and-done player. Uh, I would tell you this. The one-and-done from high school is not the story of college basketball. The one-and-done with the fifth-year graduate player is what is the main story for college basketball. There are many, many more of those, and that's hurt a lot of our mid-major programs when these kids leave and go. Many, many more. Very few one and done from high school. Very few compared to that. We have about 90 seconds left. We're going to go right here into the front row. I should row. have talked longer. I would have been just, <laughs> just uh, should, have, should have a timer here. We, we all know, uh, I mean, what Grayson Allen has done on the court and the improvement he's made, but how much has he improved as a leader uh, this season? Well, he, the main way he leads is how he plays. I mean, this kid comes every day, and he's as good a competitor as there is in college basketball. And he's a great kid. He's also, you know, he works that hard in practice, but he also works that hard in the classroom. He's an academic All-American and a uh, great teammate. Um, so it, it doesn't surprise me the success that he's had. And he's, he's just a balanced, balanced kid. I mean, he... he yeah, I love him. We're going to do one more question from the initial rush. We're going to go right here in the fourth row, please. Uh, Steven Schramm from the Fayetteville Observer. Coach, you've had your fair share of one and dones as of late, and I could see this being kind of a tricky time of year for him with obviously the most important games of their college career and then these huge life changes that are just around the corner. Uh, in your experience with these kind of players, have you ever taken them aside and sort of checked in on them and seen how they're handling what could be a pretty daunting period? No, do I talk to them? Yeah, do yeah you no, talk specifically I, about that. No, yeah, you talk specifically about a guy being a senior, a guy ending his career. A, you know, yeah, and, and, you know, you never let the obvious go unsaid. So before we start postseason, I sat down with, with Brandon. I said, how are you? You know, your people are, you know, you're going to be a one, first or second pick or whatever they're saying. How does that affect you? You know, do you need – and, and to let him know that that will happen. And he'll be all right, no matter what. So just go for it. And he, he's fine. He, you know, he's not looking ahead. He's been beautiful. Brandon Ingram's been unbelievable. You know, he's wor he works hard, and he's played well. You know, and um, the pros are not even in his, on his mind. You know, he, uh, he just loves to play basketball. And... That's good. Sometimes a kid in this situation can feel pressure and not perform or rationalize and look ahead where he may not fight till the end. That hardly ever happens with us, but that can happen. With Brandon, if we lose here, it won't be because that. It will just be because the other team played better, the kid he guarded played better. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. We're up against our time deadline. Right. Thank you, Coach Krzyzewski. Thank you. Appreciate it. We have one change in that Marshall Plumley will not be here in the interview room. He will be in the locker room. So if you need to talk to Marshall Plumley, please go to the Duke locker room. All right, so we are joined by student athletes Grayson Allen and Matt Jones. We'll throw it open to questions. And why not? We'll start in the front row again. We're just going to make that tradition. Myron McCaff, ESPN, uh, both for Matt and Grayson. Uh, your coach said that Marshall is you know, one of the most important players on this team. How has his leadership 
really helped you guys throughout the NCAA tournament and before? Um, for me, uh, Marshall's our anchor, uh, especially on defensive end. Uh, for a guard to hear your big man call out the screens, kind of call out the coverage, uh, it, it helps you a lot. Uh, he gives us ultimate confidence. And more times than not, Marshall's the biggest player on the court. So uh, to have the biggest player in the court on your side, uh, you definitely want that. He's done a great job being our emotional leader. Uh, he plays with a lot of fire down there. And um, he, he makes plays that are effort plays, ripping down rebounds, um, you know, coming over and blocking shots. And, and then he, he shows his emotion, and it really fires us up and brings us all energy. You know, here in the fourth row, please. Laura Keeley with the Raleigh News and Observer. This is for both you, Matt and Grayson, just uh, the hard-hitting stuff here. But looking at uh, online pictures of the hotel you guys are staying in, it seems a little castle-esque. And was just kind of curious to, to your reaction and if it's a little bit different from where you guys have been staying this year. Grayson, why don't you start with that? It, it reminded me, I'm from Florida, so it reminded me as a little kid going to Disney and staying in one of those hotels because that's pretty much what it is. Um, that's a little different. It brings back memories of your childhood, definitely. Yeah, it, it is different. Like like G says, um, I like the the uh, that the fact that Dis Disneyland is right across the street or whatever. But um, it, I, I, yeah, it's different. <laughs> Go ahead, Stephen Strain of Fable Observer. Matt, uh, coach said that your uh, ankle, I guess, is not quite 100% healed from the North Carolina game. And I was curious um, if that was sort of what was bothering you against Yale or if it's something that, that <coughs> continues to wear on you. Um, uh, it's something that I just try to take care of day by day. Um, some days hurt more than others, but, I mean, I, against Yale, like, I just had a bad game. Um, luckily, my teammates were there, like always, to pick me up. Um, but as far as my ankle goes, it's just something that's tolerable. Uh, at this point, everybody's going through something, so I just have to get through it. Go right here. Aaron Schoonmaker, WRL Raleigh. Um, I don't know how much you guys have had a chance to watch uh, Oregon at all. I noticed a lot against St. Joe's. They pressed a lot. That's kind of what you all struggled with in Providence. How much have you seen, and, and what's your takeaway with their athleticism? Um, yeah, we've, well, we've definitely watched a lot of film on them. Uh, we don't get to see as much of them during the regular season just because West Coast and East Coast, but uh, we have seen a lot of film. Uh, they're a very athletic team, and that's what makes their press good. I mean, they have athletic guys. Um, you know, they have a lot of size out there on the court with uh, four guys around the same height. Um, and so for us, you know, we just have to be sharp and handle the press. Uh, like you said, we didn't handle it well against Yale. Um, but, you know, hopefully that will be a learning experience and we'll be better. We got Joseph, go ahead. Uh, Joseph DiPolito, Raleigh News and Observer. This is basically a follow-up to um, the last question. What challenges, either in terms of individual matchups or tactics, does Oregon pose for you, individually and collectively? Grace, you want to start? Well, they're a very athletic team. I mean, you, you look at them, you can argue they're one of the most athletic teams in the country with um, a combination of size and, um, you know, just athleticism they put on the court. And... Um, their guys attack you, and uh, so offensively they can really spread the floor, at times go five out, um, and that's tough for most teams to guard, uh, the way they can take guys off the dribble, kick out, most almost all their guys can hit threes, so um, it's a tough team to defend. And then defensively, um, with the lineup that they do have out there, it allows them to switch a lot of stuff, um, because they all can guard similar positions, and um, I mean, th that's a tough team when you have versatile players like that. Matt? Um, Kind of like what G says, they um, they can attack us like we try to attack others uh, with four guards and a very athletic big man. So I mean, um, like like G said, their athleticism can really can really affect uh, affect people and the way they play. They play really hard and they're uh, very well coached. So I mean, we just have to try to ma uh, match their intensity. Go right here in the middle, please, about the fifth row. Austin Meek with the Register Guard and Eugene uh, for both players, starting with Grayson. There's a bunch of big name programs that play in this tournament every year, Kansas and Carolina and Kentucky, but it seems like when people see Duke, it inspires maybe some extra strong feelings. Um, have you guys experienced that, and do you have any thoughts on maybe why that is? Um, well, at, at this point in the, in the tournament, Sweet 16, it doesn't matter who you are, you're going to get the other team's best. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're Duke or who, who you are. So. Uh, at this point, I don't, I, don't, I don't think that's a factor for the other team. Um, you know, we know when we go to gyms that 
there's going to be a section of Duke fans, a section of Oregon fans, and everyone else is rooting against us, and so we're okay with that. Go right here in the fourth row, please. Karen Krauss from the New York Times. If you guys could both answer this, among the teams left in the tournament, you have, are among the lower scoring second half teams. To what do you attribute that, and is it even worrisome to you at all? Matt, why don't you start on this one? Um, I don't think it's worrisome. Um, we've, we've proven time and time out throughout the year that we can score the ball, uh, no matter the, the half. Um, obviously, we haven't had, like you said, the, the second halves that we will, we would like. But um, we're, we're fortunate enough to have another game uh, to where we can try to put a, a, a complete game together, uh, first and second half. So, I mean, as far as scoring the ball goals, uh, that's not really our problem. Uh, we've been fortunate about that, and we just have to get stops. Grayson? Uh, yeah, I mean, for us, we just need to stay in attack mode the whole game. Uh, we have a lot of scores on our team, and, um, you know, with that, we have guys that come out to hot starts. Um, you know, Luke and Brandon can uh, really just get going early. Uh, so for us, you know, we just have to fight through the little break at halftime and come out in the second half uh, attacking the same way. we go here in the front row and then in the third row. I believe Yale had uh, 20 offensive rebounds, scored 21 second chance points. How important will it be tomorrow to really be physical with Oregon and to keep them off the glass? It'll, it's very, very important, uh, especially with their athleticism. And uh, they send a lot of guys after the glass, um, you know, three, four, sometimes five guys. Um, in the St. Joe's game, they got a big bucket at the end off of an offensive rebound. And so we know that's going to be a key. Uh, you know, it, it's been one of our weaknesses, but. We want to try to make it a strength for us, defensive rebounding and, um, you know, really limit second chance opportunities. And, yeah, like G says, um, that's one of their strengths. But um, like I said earlier, we're fortunate enough to have another game. Uh, anything can happen. We can come out and have our best, best rebounding game. So, I mean, we just have to focus on that and focus on our game plan. Third row, please. Uh, Greg Beecham, Associated Press. Uh, Matt, how much during the course of the season do you refer to what happened to last year and the experience you guys had? Because you're in a place where you've all been before. You've experienced, you know, the highest you can get. And, and Oregon's, Oregon's still trying to break through that level. How much does last year's experience help you? Uh, it helps a lot. Like you said, uh, we've, had, we've had guys. We have guys that have been here before. Uh, so obviously we can take that experience and just make sure that the young guys know that it's going to be a different atmosphere. Um, the first and second round was good, but it's nothing like Sweet 16, Elite 8 kind of uh, atmosphere. So, I mean, we have to make sure that they're tuned in to what we need to do, um, make sure that they're, f they're focused on the game plan and, and just to have fun because at the end of the day, it's, it's just a game. And, and if they have fun and be themselves, then we should be all right. We're going to go here on the far left, please. Hayden Kim, member media group, um, just to both of you. Um, just Oregon as a program as in general, what have you guys made of their ascension as a program since Dana Allman arrived in 2010? He's done a great job. I mean, you can tell they're a very well-coached team, um, and they're very talented as well. So, I mean, it's a credit to him doing a great job recruiting. Um, you know, look at the team that they have. They have a combination of young guys. You know, Dorsey is a really good freshman and uh, older guys as well. Um, and, and so to have that combination, I mean, he, he's doing a good job there. I think what really impresses me is how, how hard they play. Uh, they play together. Uh, you can tell that they're, that they're comfortable with each other. And uh, that's credit to their uh, their coaching. Any further questions? Final call. All right, thank you, gentlemen. So we're about four minutes away from having Oregon student athletes Dwayne Benjamin and Elgin Cook, and head coach Dana Altman, who will be here at 2:45.
So wait, who's who's out? And Brooks is in. So we have an audible on the student athletes. We will now have Dylan Brooks and Elgin Cook for Oregon. They'll be here momentarily. They're making their way from the locker room. If you need to talk to Dwayne Benjamin, he will be in the locker room. I, I'll do it anyway. Jim, Jim Alexander. All right, you're back to number one. I would, but there's a giant table leg there. That's why I separated them. Otherwise, he's going to be kicking it the whole time. I can push them all over. hockey locker room. All right, we're joined by student athletes Dylan Brooks and Elgin Cook. We'll open up to questions. Please identify yourself and your affiliation uh, before asking the question, and please direct it to a specific student athlete. And Joseph, you've got the first one. Go for it. Joseph DiPolito, Raleigh News and Observer. I'd like to ask both Dylan and Elgin this question. What kinds of challenges, either in terms of individual matchups or tactics, does Duke present? And what makes Brandon Ingram unique among the different players you've had to face? Elgin, why don't you take it first? Duke's a, Duke's a great team, well coached, and they shoot the three really well. They like to get up and down in transition. And uh, Brandon Ingram, he can put the ball on the floor. He's long, he's athletic, and uh, we'll, we'll have our hands full. Uh, I'll go ahead. Uh, Brandon Ingram brings a lot to the table. You know, I like I'll just say he's long. And, you know, we, ne we never played a, a player li like that. Um, you know, he shoots the three well, and he's like 6'8". So, you know, he brings a lot to the table. And then, you know, Duke, you know, they're well coached. And they got guys that always are looking to attack. So, Here in the front row, please. Myron Metcalf, ESPN, uh, for Dylan Elgin. Uh, how much pressure do you feel, if any, as the last team from the Pac-12 still standing? Uh, in the Sweet 16? 
Elgin, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's no pressure on us. We just coming in, trying to play Oregon basketball, and just trying to add another uh, game to the win column. Uh, you know, we came first in the Pac-12, so, you know, it was bound for us to, you know, be this far, uh, you know, leading the Pac-12. And, you know, we're just going to go out there, execute the game plan, and, you know, try to keep on winning. Go in the back here on the left, please. Jermaine Franklin with TSN. Uh, this question is for both uh, Dylan and Elgin. Um, can you guys talk a little bit about uh, your last game against St. Joe's? And how that made, how that probably or possibly made you stronger, facing the adversity uh, you did moving forward in this tournament. Elgin, you're, you're closer to the mic. Go ahead. Uh, St. Joseph's is a great team. They got a lot of good players, and uh, we knew they was gonna make a run. They're a good offensive team, and uh, they took us out of our character. They made us do some things we haven't done all year, and uh, I think we've been facing adversity all year, fighting back. We we got down a, a, a couple times this year, and just about coming together and. And executing our game plan. Dylan? Yeah, uh, you know, St. Joe's, you know, really took the punch to us in the second half. And then, you know, we were down seven. And, you know, coach uh, told us to be poised in everything we do. And, you know, we've been fighting adversity all year. This ain't nothing different. So, you know, we just came out there and, you know, did what we did. Uh, in, in such, you know, just attacking the basket and, you know, f uh, playing together. And, you know, togetherness equals toughness. Um, yeah, you know, I think so. Uh, you know, we weren't really down never like that in, in, in the regular season. So, you know, it, it, it was a really good test for us, you know, especially with Duke coming in. You know, they can make, you know, big runs. They can shoot a three. So, you know, even if we're down, you know, never count us out. Going to go right here in the third row and then to the front row. Uh, Greg Beecham with Associated Press. Elgin, uh, you guys have accomplished a lot of incredible things this year, but playing Duke in the NCAA tournament is about the biggest spotlight you can be under in college basketball. Uh, is that special to you guys? And also, what kind of what kind of uh, what kind of product are are people going to see around the country? What kind of style of play do you want to represent out of Oregon that people will see for the first time? Uh, yeah, it's, this is a real big game. Every game is a big game. Uh, Duke's a great team. Uh, Coach K is a legend. Duke has a lot of history behind him, and uh, we're just going to come try to get up and down the court, uh, hold some defense, and uh, just be active. We just want to be active and get a lot of deflections. Dylan, you want to comment at all? Um, you know, we're just going to show Oregon basketball, uh, you know, like Elgin said, getting up and down, being really active, you know, contributing on the rebounding and on the defensive end, and just, you know, follow Coach's game plan, his recipe that he's been preaching all year, uh, rebounded basketball on both ends, limit our turnovers, and, you know, share the basketball. Go here in the front row and then back to the back. Um, throughout the regular season for Elgin, uh, you guys are one of the best teams in the country at points off turnovers. I think you have 21 in your two games, uh, less than your season average. What do you have to do to pressure Duke and to not only create turnovers, but also you know get offense uh, off of forcing those turnovers? Uh, we just need to be under control, just execute our game plan. We know they're going to get up and down. They, they score a bunch of points. We know they're going to be aggressive in attacking. Uh, we just need to, uh, I don't know, just, just what you think. <laughs> no, nah, we're just going to have to make them do what they don't usually do, you know, force them to their weaknesses, uh, make them get out of character and try to, you know, play hero basketball. And that will, you know, uh, contribute in our, in, our, uh, in, win, uh, in our win column, for sure. Go to the back, please. Jermaine Franklin with TSN. Dylan, can you talk about your role in the team and, and how you helped this team? Uh, with their success, and it's two questions in one, because obviously you're Canadian as well. A lot of the nation will be keeping an eye on this game specifically for that, and how does that feel for you as well? Um, you know, it feels great, you know, having all this support, you know, from uh, Eugene, Oregon, and, you know, uh, and in Canada as well. You know, it just uh, makes my game excel even, even higher. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're just... Uh, 
going to, you know, come out here and, you know, really try to take it to Duke. You know, I know a lot of the guys are really motivated. You know, I've been watching Duke, you know, all our lives. And, you know, once we see, you know, the lettering, you know, D-U-K-E, you know, we're just going to come out there with, you know, red on our face and just really take it to them. Go Bob. Uh, Bob Kaiser, Orange County Register. To both guys, how much of the basketball team's success in the last couple of years is related to the, te the football team's success, the fact that Oregon kind of made that double bowl part of the college football team? Um, you know, Coach Coach Altman is always at the uh, practices for, uh, you know, the football team with, you know, Halford and stuff. And, you know, they, they just learn off each other. And, you know, we're great supporters of them and they're a great supporter of us. And, you know, they've been having a winning culture for, you know, for a long time, you know, with all the coaches there and, you know, all the great players that came out of there. And, you know, we're just trying to replicate the same thing. Back to the front row. For, for Elgin, you guys came into this game, into the tournament, after a 31-point win over Utah in the Pac-12 championship. How much confidence did that give you guys entering this? Uh, it gives us a lot of confidence. That game, we just played it, played as a team. We shared the ball. We played team defense. We was all talking out there. And uh, just being able to put some wins together, going into a tournament, it always gives you a bunch of confidence. Any further questions? Last call? All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. So we're about three minutes away. Say again? Okay. About three to four minutes away from Oregon coach Dana Altman.
right, we are joined by Oregon head coach Dana Altman. We'll open up with a statement from Coach Altman, then open up to questions. Once again, we ask that you please raise your hand and identify yourself and your affiliation prior to asking a question. That way, we know who we're talking to. Coach, welcome to Anaheim. The floor is yours. This is a great opportunity for, for our basketball program. Uh, Duke is uh, a brand uh, all by itself in college basketball, and uh, it's a great opportunity for our young team to, to play on this uh, stage, and uh, hopefully we'll play well. Right here in the front row, we'll go two in the front row. Uh, Meyer Metcalf, ESPN. Uh, Dana, you're the last team, your team's last team standing from the Pac-12. Uh, how fair is it to use, you know, the Pac-12 losses and as a standard of measuring, you know, the power of the league overall? I think every year, uh, one, two leagues are, you know, evaluated by not performing well in the tournament. Uh, I think last year was the Big 12. You know, it, uh, it's something that every league goes through um, because there's so much emphasis on the NCAA tournament. Uh, but our, our league had a great year. And uh, we've got a lot of young talent in our league. Uh, the competition, you know, throughout the season was outstanding. Uh, I've only been in the league six years. Uh, but it was our best year top to bottom. Uh, I'm a little disappointed, like everyone in the Pac-12, that we didn't fare a little better here in the tournament. Uh, but uh, it doesn't take anything away from a great year. And uh, I think the future is really good for our league. But uh, we haven't done well, and, and that's fair. I mean, uh, we will take criticism for that. Uh, but, but again, uh, we had a good year. And again, I think uh, as long as I've followed the tournament, someone always gets it. You know, at, at this time of year, you know, they're always uh, picking at somebody for not doing well in the tournament. Jeff? Dana, uh, Jeff Eisenberg with Yahoo Sports. I, I wondered if you could take me back uh, six years. Uh, I know you had had opportunities to leave Creighton before that. What was it about the Oregon job that, uh, you know, was, was such a good fit for you? It was a, a really difficult decision to leave Creighton. Uh, I had 16 really great years there and uh, people were unbelievable to us in Omaha. I'm from Nebraska, my wife's from Nebraska. Uh, our families live there. So it, uh, it, it was a real tough decision. And, uh, you know, I just, at that time, I'd been at Creighton 16 years and, uh, uh, you know, I, I needed a little bit of a change. Uh, Creighton needed a little bit of a change. And uh, so this was an opportunity. Uh, when they came to talk to me, um, uh, you know, I, I listened and I was intrigued. Uh, you know, I've joked a number of times over the years that I'm not sure if I was their 38th or 39th choice, but uh, by the time they got to me, I, I was excited. And uh, Pat Kilkenny and, and the people I talked to, uh, you know, were, were excited about what we could do at Oregon. And um, so it, it just happened to fit. We've already got three on this side, start in the back and work our way up. AJ Jacobson with Rivals.com. Coach, this team seems to have improved, you know, from the beginning to this point, and now it seems to be like peaking at, at this time, your team. What areas would you say have improved the most uh, for your basketball team this year? The communication we've had defensively is, has improved throughout the season, and because of that, uh, we're a much better defensive team now than we were earlier. Um, we had a lot of room to grow into because we were we were not very good early. And Jordan Bell missed our first 10 games, and, and Jordan's really helped our depth, and, and he's a good shot blocker, as is Chris. Um, so that has really helped our defense. Uh, the last 10 games, um, I think we've only been out-rebounded twice. St. Joe's beat us by a couple, and, and Arizona beat us on the boards. But the other eight games, our rebounding's been pretty good. I think throughout the year, we've shared the ball pretty good and, and made plays for each other. So uh, I, I would have to say our defense and, and rebounding has improved a little bit throughout the season. And, you know, uh, I thought our ball movement, with the exception of St. Joe's, I, I didn't think we moved the ball well offensively there at all. Uh, but with the exception of that game, I thought, you know, our guys have done a pretty good job of sharing the basketball. Right here in the fifth row, please. I need a two-part question. One. Could you identify just, yourself, please? Uh, Steve Bemson, the Register Guard. Does 
playing Duke, do you see that as an opportunity for Oregon to name out on the national stage and maybe boost the profile of Oregon basketball? And the second part, you played them in your sixth game, a little different circumstances. What's kind of your recollection of, of the, where the programs were then and, and a little difference now? Well, uh, <laughs> rather forget that game. Uh, but uh, that was our first year, and uh, um, we were not very good, you know. We had guys that really wanted to be there and really wanted to compete, but uh, you know, I think Duke was coming off a national championship there also, and uh, um, they got us pretty good. But anytime you get an opportunity to play someone as, uh, as this well established as Duke, um, Coach K, it's it's a great opportunity. Um, you know, our our basketball tradition uh, is not that great. We're working hard to improve that. Um, and this is a point in, in our time that, that we need to play well. You know, we need to play well on the national stage against someone that, that is very good and has proven themselves. So it is an opportunity for our program, no doubt. Joseph? Joseph DiPolito, Raleigh News and Observer. Uh, two questions, Coach. First, about Chris Boucher. Where, what has most impressed you about him this season, either on or off the court? Where do you think he has grown the most since he came to Oregon? And about Duke, what are the biggest challenges, either in terms of individual matchups or tactics that Duke presents? First of all, Chris um, has been outstanding to work with. Uh, he's a young man that, that wants to be a basketball player, wants to improve. And everything he does on campus is to get better academically, um, you know, socially and, and with our basketball team. He's been a great addition to our program and uh, really have enjoyed working with him on and off the court. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, the second part of the question, uh, Duke creates a lot of problems because they score. You know, uh, Ingram, Allen, they got guys who can score. And uh, so it really puts pressure on your defense, transition defense, uh, their ability to shoot from three, and they take a lot of threes, you know, and, and that's been a problem for us all year, get pushing out on three-point shooters. So it, it's going to be a big test for us. We're going to have to do a much better job of, of, you know, forcing them off the line a little bit and getting out and guarding their three-point shooters. And I think a big key in the game is going to be rebounding. We're going to have to rebound the ball. Right here in the front row, please. Uh, Myron Metcalf, ESPN again. Uh, Tyler Dorsey has been one of the best three-point shooters in the country. This year, uh, one of the best in the Pac-12. I think he's two for nine uh, in the first two games in the tournament. What have you told him to try to help him get back into a rhythm and to shoot the way he has uh, throughout the season? Well, to keep shooting. Uh, he, he's uh, he's confident. He hit the big one late against St. Joe's. Uh, you know, just because he's missed a few. You know, he's shooting 42, 43 percent from from three. Um, you know, he's got to keep shooting the ball. We. We opened up the second half, uh, ran a play to get him a three, you know, just to try to get him get him going, and uh, he missed it, but it, it didn't slow him down. You know, he plays with tremendous confidence, and uh, we want him to be aggressive from the three-point line. I think any time a player struggles a little bit, you always look for good ones. You know, uh, uh, the guys that are on a roll, you kind of give them a little bit more of a green light, and, and when you're struggling just a little bit, you take a step back and really look for a good one to get that confidence going again. Jim, go ahead. Jim Alexander from the Press Enterprise in Riverside. A uh, couple of questions about Dwayne Benjamin. What were some of the things you saw in him when, we, when he was at Mount San Jacinto? And he's, he's now a pretty, pretty solid bench player. Is there, what, how did he handle the transition between starting and coming off the bench? Dwayne has been all about the team ever since he's been with us. Uh, he's done an outstanding job of, of blending with last year's team and this year's team in a role that's been different for him. And uh, uh, he's very unselfish. I, you know, I, when anybody asks, I say, we got seven starters. I'm not afraid to rotate our top seven uh, in any direction. I, I think Jordan Bell, who started for us last year but missed the first 10 games because of an injury, uh, you know, his minutes, uh, Dwayne's minutes, uh, we mix and match combinations with those two guys a lot of different ways. And the first part of your question, uh, I like Dwayne's athleticism and I like his competitiveness. And he's given us those two things uh, both seasons with us at Oregon. 
very competitive. Uh, his length you know, on the front of our press gives some people problems. Uh, his athleticism, you know, is, is really good, and, and so he's helped us there. So he's been a real mainstay for us for two years, and uh, we're going to miss him. You know, we, he and Elgin have uh, made big-time plays for us, and we're going to miss both those guys. we got Steve, then we'll go up front to Jeff. Dan, how do you match up against Brandon Ingram? I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure how we're going to do that. Um, you know, he's a unique player because of his size and his ability to go inside and out. He's very versatile. So uh, he's a tough matchup for everybody, you know, um, 18, 19 points a game. You know, uh, uh, he's been tough for everybody to match up with. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they score 81 points a game, and Allen and Ingram are their, their first two, and, and Kennard gives them a third score. So they've got guys who can score, and uh, – you know, it's going to test us defensively in all facets of our de defense, transition defense, half-court defense. Uh, they, get, they give you a hard time in a lot of areas. Jeff, go ahead. Dana, again, going back to the, uh, the hiring process a little bit, I, I think that you met with uh, Pat Kilkenny in Indianapolis. Is that right? And if so, can you describe that meeting a little bit? And, you know, was there anything that, that he was able to say that made you confident in uh, taking the job and, and vice versa in him wanting you? You know, I don't know. I um, six years ago, but you know, I I felt comfortable talking with Pat. I remember it was a long meeting, you know, and and uh, a lot was discussed, you know. Uh, but you know, I I did have a lot of confidence in him. Uh, the other people that I talked with at the university, uh, just a couple, you know, I could get the sense that uh, they were really wanting. You know, because of the new facility, uh, you know, to have a basketball program, and uh, again, it was just a, it was a good time, and personally for me, uh, to make a move. So, um, it was it was a good meeting, you know, and uh, Pat's been very supportive uh, the six years I've been there. We got time for one more question. It's going to be in the very back. We've got about a minute left. Jermaine Franklin um, with TSN. Coach, can you talk about the contributions of the Canadians on the team uh, individually and together in Boucher? And of course, um, uh, <laughs> Dylan Brooks. Blank. Brooks, yes. We've had great success uh, with the young men from Canada. Uh, it started with DeVoe Joseph and Olu Ashalu and uh, Jason Calise. Um, Dylan and uh, Chris and Dylan Ennis has, has been a big part of our team, even though he hasn't been able to play uh, because of a foot injury all season. Uh, his leadership off the court has been a big plus. But Chris and Dylan, um, for this year's team, uh, have been so much fun to work with. Uh, the tremendous progress that, that Dylan Brooks has made as a player and his maturity, um, I'm really excited for him. He's been a big part of our team a year ago, but he's even bigger this year. And, uh, and it's all because of his work ethic. You know, he's put a lot of time in uh, to change his body, to, to improve his skill level. And, uh, you know, he's, he's given us a big, big lift this year. Chris, you know, we weren't sure what we were getting with Chris. You look at him and he's, and he's pretty thin, and I wasn't sure how that would translate from junior college to the Division I level, but he is a competitor. Uh, he's very coachable. Uh, he's a fearless shot blocker. So those two guys uh, have given us, a, you know, a big lift. So we've had great success, and, and all those guys from Canada have been so much fun to work with. Uh, we've really been fortunate. All right, with that, we're going to have to wrap it up. Thank you, Coach Altman. Good Thanks. luck tomorrow. Thanks.